Uh, and we'll have a special guest today, Ralph Martin, that many of you know, he's very known in the English speaking world. And uh, he will also give you some, uh, some insight. I asked him to send me a video. And because I said, you know, Ralph, our lady is uh, concerned by the world of today. There are many people who uh, take the wrong way to eternity and they need some food, they need some teaching, they need some uh, readjustment, you know, to make sure they take the right way to the right spot, to the right goal of life. But before I let him speak, I want to say one word about him. Ralph is a good friend. I met him in 76 when I first came to Ann Arbor. He doesn't remember that. But I was very impressed by his way to speak with clarity, with the power of the Holy Spirit. And it has always developed this charism over the years. And also, I want to say the most beautiful thing about Ralph is that he is a father of six children and 18 grandchildren to, at, as today. And uh, also, he's married with a beautiful wife, Anne. And guess what? Today, after so many years of marriage, they are still together and loving each other more and more every day. Congratulations, Ralph. Now I want to start only with two or three little episodes. Uh, two of them are very personal. I remember when I was 25, unfortunately, I was uh, involved into the occult in some ways. Ouija board, astrology, divination, uh, uh, you know, the card, tarot cards, and all these things that are an abomination before God without knowing it, ignorance. But that pushed me to a very horrible state, pushed me to a point that I wanted to die. It was Im impossible to continue live like that. The pain, the anxiety, the in inner torture was so great. So, I, to make a long story short, the Lord saved me. And He saved me with a woman who um, prayed over me in a charismatic uh, in, the, in the first year of the prayer group in, in of the very famous prayer group now Emmanuel in Paris that became a community and uh, I was delivered I I was saved from kind of hell you know in a hell and I I could really taste the bounty of God and and the joy of being with God, and I was alive again. It was such a beautiful experience. But one day, as I was praying with this prayer group of Emmanuel, during the prayer, it came to my mind that thought, what if suddenly this horrible darkness would come back to me? Oh, no, no, no. And then I started begging the Lord in my heart, Lord, please, please, may your words constantly stay with me. May your love constantly be constantly with me, Lord. May I never, never leave your word and, and, and your light, Lord. And I was begging, crying out from my heart silently. At that moment, Martin Lafitte, one of the uh, members of this uh, community, she was just sat by my side, at, at my right hand side. She opened the Bible and look what she reads. She proclaimed with a very loud voice this passage from the prophet Isaiah. Listen. This is the covenant with them which I myself has made, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my word that I have put into your mouth shall never leave your mouth, nor the mouth of your children's children from now on and forever, says the Lord. I was absolutely overwhelmed. I said, Lord, I am crying out to you, and here comes your answer. On that day, my brother and sister, guess what? I understood that the Word of God is alive. It's alive. It's life. It's, it's just what we need. So it was a beautiful experience. And believe me, this kind of experience, I had it many, many times after that. Now I want to tell you, to share with you another little episode of my personal life. It was also a few days after my conversion. You know, when there is somebody converted, 
coming from very far, far away from him, he has to kind of be strong with that person. I was with a member of the prayer group and we were reading the Bible. I open my Bible. I take a passage from, I think, from St. Luke. And at that moment, as I was reading these lines, all the words became fire, but real fire. Little flames were coming from all the words. I cannot explain how flames could come from a piece of paper, you know, but there were flames, little flames. And these flames, you know, fire should burn, should hurt. No, it was not hurting, not burning. It was food. It was food that entered in my heart, like, like a sweet food, like, a, like food from heaven. I can't have words to describe that food. That was both food and fire. And I, I couldn't keep my eyes off this paper, this reading, because it was so good. It was like, you know, feeding my, my emptiness, my, my vacuum, feeding my, the whole of my heart, feeding my misery, feeding with divine stuff, divine food. It was extraordinary. And uh, I was reading and reading. I couldn't get my eyes off this gospel. It was gospel from, from Luke. I can read the passage, but it was, it, it lasts quite a bit of time. And uh, so th this was the word, you know, Jesus talking to his people. But I said to you, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To him who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your clock, do not withhold your coat as well. Give to everyone who begs from you. And of him who takes away your goods, do not ask them again. And as you wish that men would do to you, do so to them. And then, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. And so on and so on and on and on. So that was the second time when God showed me that His, His Word is a living Word, a food, a, a direction, a light, the secret of his heart. Beautiful. Now, just a third little episode that not from me, but that I cherish a lot because today we have our Bibles at home, hopefully. But maybe these Bibles are having some dust on the top, you know. We should have the Bible opened in a visible place, says Our Lady, so that every day we may read a passage from the Bible. And may the father of family read the Bible, the passage of the life of Jesus or something to their children, that the seeds of the Word of God may be there, that fire may be there, that light may be there, that love may be there, you know, growing with that love. So what happened, you know, in, in this country, which is now Herzegovina and uh, During the communist time, there was an order that all the Catholic and Protestant people would bring their Bible on the marketplace and this Bible would be burned. And there was a big fire with all the Bibles and those communists running around, you know, with laughters of mockery and things. It was horrible. In spite of the interdiction, some good believers, strong believers, courageous believers had nothing to do with the threat. And we know what, they would keep their Bibles. They would uh, bury their Bible in the basement of their house, dig a hole, put the Bible there in a box, cover it, and, and at night, the family would go there in the basement with the light of the candles. And he who knew how to read in the family took the Bible off the, uh, the hole 
and would read for hours the Word of God because under, under the communism with so many lies around, you know, this um, atheism, it was impossible for them. So they would then, they would soak in the Word of God, their hope, their joy, their future, their eternity, their, their God, their friend, their best friend, their Savior. And they would read like at the light of the candles. And then, you know, it was very dangerous. It was very, the threat was real, you know. But guess what? Our lady came, and what did she say? Dear children, it was still communism, okay? And what did she say? She said, dear children, I invite you to put your Bibles in an open place, in a visible place in your homes. And every day, I invite you to read a passage of this Bible. And when somebody comes to you in your house, to share also this Bible with your friends. Visible place, under communism, many did it, and guess what? Nothing happened, they were protected. They were put under the mantle of Our Lady. And so that was my third episode. I have spoken already too much. Now I want to let Ralph speak to you. And uh, before he speaks to you, I want to tell you more about Ralph. Now, I told you, about Ralph, what he is. He's a real disciple of Jesus. That's the most important. A father of big family, a grandfather, a wonderful uh, husband. So that's what he is. But now look what he does. So Ralph Martin is the president of Renewal Ministries. He's also the director of graduate theology programs in evangelization and a professor of theology at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in the Archdiocese of Detroit. Pope Benedict XVI appointed Ralph as a consultant to the Pontifical Council for the New Evangelization, which is, not, which is big, which is big. And he continues to serve in this capacity. Ralph also was appointed as a theological expert for the Synod of the New Evangelization. That's grand. He is the author of the widely read The Fulfillment of All Desires and many other books but this is my, my, my favorite one, and I recommend. Many of the books on spirituality and evangelization. Now, Ralph, please tell us, share with us a little bit of the big light, divine light the Lord has placed in your heart, in your mind, to teach his people, his children, who are so thirsty of the truth today as never before. And thank you for coming. Hello, brothers and sisters. My wife, Ann, and myself just really love Sister Emmanuel and love the message of our Mary at Medjugorje. And just uh, I'm really pleased to be able to share something with you that hopefully could be helpful uh, in responding to Mary's request. You know, one of the most famous things, of course, that Mary said in the scripture is do whatever he tells you. So paying really close attention to what Jesus is telling us is a really important part of getting home to our Father in Heaven, which is, of course is the goal. So I'd like to start here with some of the things that sacred scripture says about Jesus, about the importance of paying attention to what's revealed to us in sacred scripture. John chapter three, verse 16. This is a scripture passage you know so well, but it is so relevant, it is so helpful, it is so illuminative. It really is an excellent summary of the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So this is all about being saved. What are we being saved from? We're being saved from being locked in our sin, being alienated from God, being subjective to the uh, lies of the devil, being subjected to the distortions of our culture. You know, Jesus in another text, Matthew chapter seven, talked about the broad way and the narrow way. He said, broad is the way that leads to destruction and many are traveling that way. Narrow is the door that leads to life and few there are who are finding it. Now, if I were to describe how many of our fellow Catholics, unfortunately, look at the world today, 
I describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and almost everybody's going that way. Narrow is the door that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. Now, this is shocking because it's the exact opposite of what Jesus tells us in Scripture about the broad way and the narrow way. Now, what's the narrow way? The narrow way is Jesus. And it's only narrow because we have to turn away from the broad way in order to enter onto it. So let's take a look at that very first sentence of John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. It's all about love. God is love. It's all about love. It's because God loves us so much that he's sending his mother to us to remind us of who Jesus is and how important it is to believe in him and obey him and listen to him and turn to him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, why would he give his only begotten son? Because the world turned away from him. The human race turned away from him. The human race rebelled. And that's why we have sin. That's why we have death. That's why we have suffering because of we've departed from the right way, the path of love and union with God. But God, because he loved us so much, sent his only son. Now, we can hardly begin to understand the magnitude of the gift that God himself, the word would become flesh and dwelt among us and go through human life like he did and experience thirst and hunger and pain and suffering and all the things that Jesus went through, including the horrible rejection of Jesus by his own people, the horrible mocking of him, the horrible crucifixion. No greater love does a person have than he gives his life for his friends. Maybe if we're a really good person, we'd give our life for our friends, but Jesus gave his life for us while we were his enemies. God gave his life for us while we were not his friends, when we were going our own way. But here's the key thing. God has done more than enough to wipe away the sins of the entire human race. God has done more than enough to completely reconcile everybody on the face of the earth who's ever lived or ever will live with himself. But there's just one thing that needs to happen for that to be true. We have to believe in him. We have to repent. We have to say, Lord, I need your mercy. Lord, I need your forgiveness. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. A lot of times people skip over the should not perish part, but it's absolutely true. Without Jesus, we will perish. Without his love, without his forgiveness, without putting faith in him, without turning away from our sin, without asking him for forgiveness, we will perish. And not just in terms of dying on this earth, but the second death, the eternal separation from God. So let's continue here. God did not send the world into the, the, the Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world might be saved through him. Jesus didn't come just to improve earthly governments. Jesus didn't come even to heal everybody. Jesus came to save us from eternal separation from God. Jesus came to save us from hell. Jesus came to bring us back to paradise, to bring us back to the Father's house. But we have to pay attention to him in order to get back to the Father's house. Jesus is saying, come follow me and I will show you the path. Not only will I show you the path, but I am the path. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Remember one day he said to the Pharisees, he said, you're searching the scriptures, but you refuse to come to me for life. Oh, we need to come to Jesus. We need to open our hearts to him. We need to receive his love. We need to put our faith in him and we won't be condemned. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We have to remember that not to believe in the Son of God uh, after all that he said, and all that he's done, all his miracles, after the Father testifying to him, the cloud opening saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, listen to him after sending the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that comes now through the sacraments, 
to ignore all that, to ignore the testimony of Christians we know, to ignore the incredible effort God is making by sending Mary to call us back to our senses is a grave sin. Unbelief is a grave sin. It isn't just sins of the flesh or, or greed or oppressing the poor. That's a grave sin. But not to believe in the Son of God is a severe sin that could separate us from Him forever. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does what is true comes to the light, that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. Let's not be like those who love the darkness rather than the light. Let's not be like those who harden our hearts when mercy comes to knock on our doors of our heart. Jesus in the book of Revelation is knocking on the door of our heart. He so much wants to come in. He so much wants to be our friend. He so much wants to bring us back to the Father's house. He so much wants to bring us back to paradise. We have to open our heart. We have to believe. Okay, one more passage from Luke chapter 13. I, I want to emphasize again the uh, the importance of Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, about the broad way and the narrow way. If you go along with the culture, if you go along the way that everybody's going, you're going to go over the cliff. St. Faustina had a vision one day of people happily going along a path. There was no obstacles. And all of a sudden, they came to the abyss and they fell off. And others who were taking a difficult, stony road, that there was pain and sorrow on it. But as soon as they got to their destination and entered paradise, they forgot all their sufferings. That's why scripture says, the sufferings of the present age are not worth comparing to the glory that will be ours when Christ Jesus appears. So don't forget that the broad way, going the easy way, going the way our culture is telling us to go is heading over the cliff. You won't be on the right side of history. Don't try to be on the right side of history. Try to be on the right side of Jesus. Don't end up falling off a cliff. Don't end up suffering the second death. Okay, last scripture passage for today. Luke chapter 13. He went on his way, verse 22. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. He's doing that today. He's knocking on the door of so many people's hearts through the difficulties we're experiencing right now and just all the... All, all the things that are going on in the world and even in the church. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Will those who are saved be few? Let's see what Jesus says. Now, it might not be what we're expecting. He's not going to give out numbers. He's not going to give out percentages. He's also not going to kind of give us kind of flaky scripture scholarship saying, oh, guys, I, I didn't really mean to take that literally. And, you know, uh, you know, don't you remember your scripture classes? You know, that's Jewish hyperbole. I was just exaggerating, you know, cool, chill. You know, don't don't stress out about this. You know, don't take it too literally. He doesn't say either of those things. What he says, though, is so important. He said to them, try to enter by the narrow door for many i tell you will not will seek to enter and will not be able to when once the householder has risen up and shut the door you'll begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying lord open to us and he will answer you i do not know where you come from then you'll begin to say well lord we ate and drank in your presence we hung out with you in the streets we went to your healing services and he'll say, I tell you, I do not know you. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Then you will weep and gnash your teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. The underlying Greek word for try very hard to enter the narrow door is the word that we get our English word agonized from. Do everything you can. Do whatever you have to do. Like Jesus said, I think in Matthew 5 or Matthew 11, he said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. 
If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better to enter life missing a limb than to end up in hell with an intact body. Now that is Jewish hyperbole. He doesn't want us to cut off our arm or cut off our eye, but he's saying, do whatever you have to do to break with sin. Go to confession, go to the Eucharist, uh, get spiritual direction, uh, go to a 12-step group, get prayer for healing and deliverance. Do whatever you have to do to get free of serious sin. The serious sin can exclude us from the kingdom of God. So then Jesus says, uh, hey, you may have come to my healing services. You hung out with me in the streets. You ate and drank with me. And I, I hate to say this, but some people who receive communion aren't receiving it worthily. And what it says in the scripture is that if you aren't receiving it worthily, if you're receiving it in, in unrepented, serious sin, you're bringing condemnation and judgment upon yourself. So people can know about Jesus, can people can be familiar with Jesus, can people can even know what Jesus teaches, but if they don't act on what Jesus teach, if they don't enter into the life he's asking us to live, if we don't become his disciple and become his friend and start praying and start reading the scripture and start paying attention to the messages of Mary, uh, we may find ourselves on the outside because we knew about Jesus, but we didn't know him. So this is just a really important text. Let's try our very hard to enter the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter, but will not be able to. So this is a wake-up call. I think we're getting a wake-up call in so many ways around the world. God's chastising, God's judging, God's showing mercy and sending Mary in so many different ways, pleading with us to accept the love of God. The, the narrow door is Jesus, and there's no narrowness in Jesus. His mercy is as wide as the sea. His mercy is higher than the sky. And he's just so eager to take us into his arms and bring us home to the Father. God bless you. This is Ralph Martin speaking to you from Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. We have a website, renewalministries.net. If you'd like to find out more about what we're doing, you can just go there, renewalministries.net. And thank you to Sister Emmanuel for the tremendous mission you're carrying out and how you're helping us all over the world to pay attention to the message that the Lord is sending us through Mary.